I, I wrote a note to you about Thanksgiving, and I'd like to kind of share that as an introduction to the sermon today. Uh, this week, our nation paused to celebrate the holiday of Thanksgiving. By the way, that's a very incredible thing, that a whole nation would pause to celebrate Thanksgiving. Don't you dare call it Turkey Day. It is Thanksgiving. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's the giving of thanks. And even though I'm a football fan and can't believe the good fortune that the Cowboys have actually won three games in a row, that is not the goal of Thanksgiving, is not turkey or football. It's a day to give thanks. Like many traditions, we tend to forget the reason we have this holiday. Beginning with the pilgrims in 1621 who set apart a day for Thanksgiving at Plymouth immediately after their first harvest, continuing through George Washington and other U.S. presidents, A day for giving thanks was observed throughout the colonies and the young nation. It was not until 1863, however, at the height of the Civil War, a national holiday of Thanksgiving was formalized by President Abraham Lincoln. In the midst of the most grim and bloodiest war in American history, Lincoln wrote these words, quote, This year that is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we're prone to forget the source from which they come. Prone to forget the source from which they come. Others have been added, which are of the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gift of the Most High God, who while dealing with us in anger for our sins... By the way, Lincoln felt that the Civil War was God's judgment for the sin, the national sin of slavery. They are gracious gifts of the Most High God, who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, has nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and voice, By the whole American people, I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwells in the heavens. Lincoln wrote these, as I said, in the middle of the Civil War. And in many ways, gratefulness is the barometer of one's soul. The more prideful we are over our good fortune, or the more bitter we become over our misfortune, the less we will be able to express thanksgiving with any measure of authenticity. Lincoln offered this declaration during times of great personal, he had lost his son, and national loss. Recognizing that God was not to be blamed for calamity, but that it was his mercy that brought about bounty. So my question as we begin the message today is, how is your soul? You can measure that by how thankful you are. This has been a very difficult year for some, and yet we are called to be filled with gratitude. As we begin this holiday season, this holiday, not just week, but but month, really, please consider the words of Lincoln and celebrate the transcendent worth of thanksgiving. Please remember what the Apostle Paul told the Thessalonian believers. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything. Everybody say, in everything. everything. Try that one more time. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen? So the spiritual truth is that thanksgiving is something that God has called us to. It's not just a day of festivity, although that's certainly okay. I'm going to talk about that a great deal in the service today. And that is that even in the Old Testament, the holidays were feasts. They were a celebration of bounty. They were a celebration of life. They were a celebration of the goodness of God. 
They were a celebration of the care of God. So, so I, I don't want to tell you that it's okay to be gluttonous because it's not. But it is okay on occasion to feast in remembrance and celebration of the goodness of God. But Thanksgiving is more than a four-day weekend. It's more than a, than a series of football games. In fact, in a very real way, Thanksgiving is not something we create. It is something we steward. It's an attitude that we foster. It is the only proper response to God is thanksgiving. The only appropriate attitude for the believer is thanksgiving. The way to be filled with joy is through the path of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving means, according to the dictionary, the act of giving thanks, a prayer expressing gratitude, a public acknowledgement or celebration of divine goodness. Paul told the Ephesian believers, and this will be our text this morning, Ephesians 5, verse 1. I'll be reading out of the Amplified, and that's in your notes and on the screen. Paul writes, he says, therefore, become imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example. As well-beloved children imitate their father. And walk continually in love. That is, value one another. Practice empathy and compassion. Unselfishly seeking the best for others unselfishly seeking the best for others. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, slain for you so that it became a sweet fragrance. Say that phrase with me. A sweet fragrance. One more time. A sweet fragrance. Sexual immorality and all moral impurity, indecent, inoffensive or offensive behavior or greed must not be even hinted at. Why, by the way, just for context, because we won't talk about this verse a whole lot. Because in verse two, he says to value one another. And he's showing you in verse three things that devalue others as well as yourself. Among you, there must not even be a hint of these things. These, for it is proper for among saints as believers, our way of life, whether in public or in private, reflects the validity of our faith. Let there be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse, obscene or vulgar joking. Again, why? Because it shows a lack of value for others. Such things are not appropriate for believers. But here's what is. Instead, speak of your thankfulness to God. Instead, speak of your thankfulness to God. Father, we love you. We are grateful that we can be here today. I'm grateful that my friends are here today. I'm grateful that the family of God has gathered today. I'm grateful for so much. And Lord, we are all grateful for your word and the anointing of your spirit to understand your word. Please grant to us that grace again today. Grant that we would have minds that can receive the message. Grant that we would have ears that can hear the message. Grant that we can have hearts that would respond to the message. And Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that you would anoint me and that you would remove those things that are me from this conversation and release, please, the message and the word of your truth today. For these are your people. These are the sheep of your pasture. They need to hear the voice of their shepherd. Grant that that voice would be your voice today, spoken with power and with grace, with humility and with love. And I thank you for this, Father, in the sacred name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And all who agreed said together, Amen. 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 Would you please read that last phrase on the screen with me again? But instead, speak of your thankfulness to God. Look at that word, instead. In my, in my notes, I've, I've circled it. 
Instead, be different. Don't degrade people. Don't violate people. Do no harm to people with your words or your deeds. Watch the attitude of your heart. Watch the way you look at one another. Watch the way you treat one another. And the best way, the simplest way, the, the, most, uh, the, the most prolific way to learn to do this is to learn to be thankful to God. It's impossible to degrade somebody I'm actually thankful for. It's impossible to harm somebody intentionally that I actually love and care for. Instead, speak of your thankfulness to God. Thankfulness is the alternative from the way of the world. The great sin of America, and we've got many, and we, we worship mammon. But the great sin of America is our ingratitude, our ungratefulness, our lack of thanksgiving. And we cannot blame the world for that behavior because they are lost. But when this is in the church... We no longer have the influence in the community. When you're as angry as your neighbor, you're not different than your neighbor. When you're as cruel as your neighbor, you're not different than your neighbor. I don't care how dark the season may be. I don't care how dark the world may become. I don't care how much light may be blocked off. A little light goes a long way when it's truly dark. A little voice that says, I'm grateful. A little voice that says, I'm thankful. A little voice that says, God is good. Swims against the, the, the refuse and the, and the flow of destruction in a way that you and I can't begin to understand. Because the Lord, Psalm 22, 3, write this down because it's not in your notes. The Lord dwells in the midst of the praise of his people. So the Lord will manifest his beauty. He'll manifest his love. He'll manifest his grace in the midst of our worship, in the midst of our praise. So when the people of God, when all the stream says this is bad and violence and hatred and anger and despair and, and despicable behavior is just coming at us like a torrent. One voice that says God is good. One voice that says, I'm thankful to be alive. I'm thankful that I have breath today. I'm thankful that God gave me life today. One voice swims against that entire stream. You say, how? Because in that one voice, God puts his throne, hallelujah, right into the midst of that voice of worship. Amen. And he can overcome everything. Thankfulness is the alternative to worldliness. Thankfulness is the alternative to unrighteousness. Thankfulness is the alternative to the, to the flow of, of disgusting behavior that the adversary is sending our way and that the corruptness of the wicked are sending our way. Thanksgiving, hallelujah. Thanksgiving changes that. And it cannot start in the world. It must begin in the house of the Lord. I want you to think about something today. During the holidays, and especially Thanksgiving, but really during all the holidays, we're very much like the Old Testament, as I mentioned earlier. They're feast days. You know, and, and I, I mean, my, my goodness, we actually plan to overeat. I read a stat that said the average American will gain six pounds during the holiday season. Some of you are going, <laughs> lightweights. <laughs> the average American will gain six pounds during the holiday season. Don't let that be you, by the way. But it's okay to have a day. You don't, but, you know, I think the real culprit in the holidays are the leftovers, but that's another sermon, okay? 
We stuff turkey and we stuff our faces. It's a little crazy, but it's also a celebration of the harvest. It's a celebration of life. And again, one day to some degree is okay. It's here in this act of eating a meal with family, with friends, with colleagues, and remembering the focus of our gathering is Jesus. That we learn a great lesson in life. God is good. God is our provider. God brought something to our table that is unique and different. This isn't a can of soup. This is actually a handcrafted meal. Even in the preparation of that meal, we can learn a lot about Thanksgiving. A great meal is the collection of ingredients placed in the right order at the right time and in the correct proportion. Last Sunday, we got to celebrate together. And I thank you, by the way, for, for giving so generously and raising money for, the, uh, for the, our benevolence ministries and our outreach ministries and the fire victims uh, in California. And that meal was all part of it. We had gathered together to feast together. And we had, we had, we had friends in, in the church here who prepared the meal. And oh, it was delicious. And it was wonderful. And they, they, they prepared it with love and then they served it with love as others in the church served it. And then, and then we, we sat down, we ate together, we listened to some music together, we shared a few words, we talked about some things we want to do with the resources that come in. And it was just a wonderful time of celebration. It was a feast and it was appropriate. But someone had to do a lot of labor for that to come to pass. Someone had to prepare the meal. They had to put it in the correct proportion. They had to put it at the right time. So with that in mind and with the, the, the feast idea behind it, I want, I want to give you a silly illustration to make a couple points, okay? So forgive me for how silly and rudimentary this is, but I think it makes the point. Do you know what this is? It's a plant. It's a root at the bottom. It's ginger. It's a ginger plant. We use the root of this plant as an ingredient in cooking, don't we? And baking. And I, by the way, love ginger. It is really good food. How about this? Do you know what this next one is? Yeah, but do you know what that cinnamon is actually the bark of a tree? Now, who, who thought of that? That's another thing I want to think of. Who saw that tree and maybe, maybe their dog was nibbling on it? I don't know. But, but cinnamon's the bark of a tree. And you almost can't have Christmas in Western society without cinnamon. Do you know what this is? That's right. It's not sweet and low. <laughs> it's sugar cane. And it's a good thing that I do not know how to grow it. Glory to God. Because I would eat all my profits. It would not be a cash crop. <laughs> how about this? Salt. Salt. How about this one? Which came first? <laughs> the chicken came first. <laughs> By the way, if you want to know for a fact, God didn't create an egg. He created the animals. Then the egg came. So which came first? The chicken. But we'd, I love fresh eggs. And some of you really like milk. The next slide. And how many of you? Soy milk. <laughs> I heard somebody say soy milk. <laughs> And who likes this, this next thing? Does anyone know what that is? It's a flowery plant. We call them cloves. Yeah, it's just, it's just a flower on a plant. How about this foxtail looking thing? Wheat. Yeah. Who would have thought that that would be so delicious? Walking through the field and seeing that and somebody went, that could be bread. And, of course, we all recognize this thing that grows out of the ground, don't we? Pumpkin. The point is, everything I showed you, no man made. No human being made anything I just showed you. God made them all. God made them all. We do not make these things. God does. That's why James said, whatever is good and perfect is a gift. Hallelujah. Coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. 
God does these things. How many of you like any of those things I just pointed out at the screen? Then how about we give thanks to God once in a while? I get a little annoyed with myself. I can't speak to others. I get a little annoyed with myself because there are times that the prayer before a meal is just kind of a getting my stomach ready to eat. I don't know. It's, it's almost done by rote. When, when you stop and ponder and think that, number one in your notes, God starts everything. God begins it all. You and I need to really start being grateful for that deep breath that you're not thinking about right now. I've learned with, with uh, some illnesses that I'm dealing with, not personally, but in my family, I've learned to, to, take, to take seriously the great grace of oxygen. And that our planet has the right mix of, 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 in, in, of uh, breathable gases that allow us to sustain ourselves and allow us to sustain our life. And isn't it just like God that, that what we breathe in, the plants breathe out, and what we breathe out, the plants breathe in, and that God created this entire system that just works together. He starts it. He starts it all. Like seeds that grow, like flowers that bloom and produce food we eat. The squash that's a root vegetable that grows out of the ground. The sun, the rain, the air that we breathe. Everything good and everything perfect comes from God. Just like the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. God provided all the talents. He provided everything. Gave one five, one two, one one. It never ceases to amaze me that we can eat something and have our lives sustained by stuff that comes out of the ground, grows on a tree, or is produced by animals, fruits, vegetables, eggs, milk, meat. He also creates the environment that we can learn to love and be kind and be grateful. He would not command you to behave a certain way if he didn't start within you the capacity to do it. That's really, really good. You should write that down. I'll say it again slower. If I can remember it. Okay. He would not command you to behave a certain way if he did not start within you the capacity to do that. Now that you heard it again, that's pretty good, huh? Three of you. Come on, wake up. <laughs> God places within you the capacity to do his will. He places within us the ability to be obedient. That's why Paul, in our text, Ephesians 5.1, would say this. Become imitators of God. Copy him. Follow his example. As well-beloved children imitate their father. Walk continually in love. That is, value one another. Practice empathy and compassion. Unselfishly seeking the best for others. Just as Christ also loved you, gave himself up for us as an offering and sacrifice to God. So, slain for you so that it became a sweet fragrance. According to 1 John, 1, or 1 John 3, 9, this isn't in your notes, so you have to write the reference down. According to 1 John 3, 9, the seed of God is already within us. So the seed of life is within us. The seed of holiness is within us. The seed of righteousness, the seed of love, the seed of mercy, the seed of grace, the seed of joy is within us. The seed of hope is within us. The seed of purpose is within us. Why? Because God starts everything. He starts within you the ability to do good. We should never take credit for anything good that comes about. But we should give thanks. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. And we should receive these things with thanksgiving. 1 Timothy 4.4 4, For everything God created is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. God provides the DNA of the seed. 
God provides the nutrients within the soil. God provides the wind and the rain and the sunlight to initiate an environment of growth. Psalm 65 says of the Lord, you take care of the earth and water it. You make it much richer than it was. The river of God is filled with water. You provide grain for them. Indeed, you even prepare the ground. Hallelujah. You drench plowed fields with rain and level their clumps of soil. You soften them with showers and bless what grows in them. God has placed within you the seed of his spirit so that everything he's called you to, everything he's intended you for, everything he's purposed before creation ever began, everything that God has designed, he has placed already within you by the power of Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. He has started within you the initiative of holiness, the initiative of righteousness, the ability to love your neighbor, the ability to speak well, the ability to encourage others, the ability to build up and not tear down. He's already put it all within you. You lack nothing. You lack nothing to accomplish what God has intended within your life. So quit whining about what you're not and give glory to God for what you are. Quit whining and complaining about what you don't have. And give glory to God for what you do have. Don't you remember the, me the feeding of the multitude with five loaves and two fishes? Jesus looked at the disciples. He didn't say, what don't you have? He said, what do you got? What do you got? What do you got? The world focuses on what they don't have. Children of faith must focus on what they do have. Knowing that five loaves and two fish is more than enough when Jesus blesses it. God starts it. Number two in your notes, though, we steward it. I've shared with you for years. God parts the water, we carry the ark. God does what only he can do, but he will not do what he's called you to do. He will not do what he's told you to do. He looks for children who are obedient. Imitate God, our text says, as dearly loved children. He looks for those who will not make excuses for their folly, but recognize that they are stewards of grace that has already been given to them. Stewardship is, for those of you that may not know, and again, we'll read from the dictionary. Stewardship is the conducting, supervising, or managing of something. Especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. This seed of God within you has been entrusted to you. This body that houses your spirit has been entrusted to you. This mind that allows you to make decisions and a, and, and a sense of the will has been entrusted to you. The family that you have, the friends and colleagues that you have, the neighborhood in which you live has been entrusted to you. The possessions that you are allowed to maintain, the house, the car, the clothing, the job, have all been entrusted to you. For these are blessings that have come from God. They're God's blessings entrusted to you, to steward, to be responsible for, to take care of. Ephesians 5 again, this time we'll read from the Passion Translation, our text. Be imitators of God in everything you do. Everybody say everything. For then you will represent your father as his beloved sons and daughters and continue to walk surrendered to the extravagant love of Christ. That's a will thing right there. See, I choose that. The love of Christ is given. I can't change it. Christ loves you no matter what. 
He's given that to you. Walking surrendered is a will thing. Continue to walk surrendered to the extravagant love of Christ. For he surrendered his life as a sacrifice for us. His great love for us was pleasing to God. Like an aroma of adoration. A sweet healing fragrance. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality or lust or greed. Why? Because that's not a surrendered walk. That's not a loving life. You are his holy ones. Let no one be able to accuse you of them in any form. Guard your speech. Everybody say, guard your Instagram. Guard your Facebook. Guard your political protests. Guard your speech. You don't represent a political party. You represent the kingdom of God. Guard your speech. Guard how you talk about one another. Guard how you speak with each other. Guard your speech. Because if you can't guard your speech, you can't guard anything. Ooh, happy Thanksgiving, huh? If you cannot guard your word, you cannot guard anything. The most immature thing I ever hear is people who fill their entire conversation with profanity. There's a reason we call it profane. My father taught me that very early on in life. He said, why is your vocabulary so small? that you have to fill it with fillers that are empty. Profane. Is that a little too real? I'm glad one of you like it. It really doesn't matter to me. But <laughs> Guard your speech. Forsake. That means make a willful decision to leave. Forsake obscenities and worthless insults. This is getting hard. These are nonsensical words that bring disgrace and are unnecessary. Instead, there's that word again. Instead, instead, let worship fill your heart and spill out in your words. You see, that river again that's coming at us is filled with all sorts of vileness and hatred and cruelty. And I'm right and everybody else is wrong. It's filled with all sorts of arrogance and boastfulness. It's filled with hatred and vileness and violence. But one person who will worship God, one person who will guard their mouth, one person who will say, I will give praise to God. And the Lord's throne descends into that moment. Begins to have a ripple effect out. Maybe as simple as, well, we don't talk that way around him. Well, good. At least that's one person they don't talk that way around. And maybe it'll become two. And maybe it'll become three. And maybe it'll become a place where they see, you know what? This is really foolish on my part. Remember all the raw ingredients we looked at a few moments ago? The plants, the flowers, the roots. Here's a picture of those same raw ingredients after someone stewarded those natural resources. They've been harvested. They've been processed. I know, you know, processing is a bad term, but that's still, you know, I, I can't make bread. So they've been processed. They've been packaged. They've been shipped to a warehouse and then to a grocery store. Think of all the stuff that's involved in getting those raw materials to you. When I say I need some cinnamon, I run down to Safeway. When I need some bread, I run down to 
probably Safeway. I mean, whatever, you know. But someone had to pick that kernel of wheat. Someone had to process, take that kernel of wheat to a place of processing. Someone had to put all that together. Someone had to peel the bark off of that tree and make cinnamon. Someone had to, had to do all of the things. Even the poor pumpkin got put into a can. But nonetheless, someone p- pulled it, processed it. Then, then somebody else drove it to the, to, the, uh, to the grocery store. There was warehoused, and then it came to your grocery store. And somebody in the middle of the night took all these boxes full of your food and put them on shelves so that you could run in there and not give a second thought to the 10 or 15 other people that were involved in stewarding those natural resources so you could have a can of pumpkin. That's what stewardship looks like. You take the raw materials that God has given to you and you work. You're diligent with them. You do the best that you can with them. These are God's resources. And then to your kitchen because someone was a good steward of these things. Ephesians 1.8 He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom. Kindness brings wisdom. I need wisdom to steward the resources God has given to me. I need understanding to steward the resources God has given to me. The capacity to love is within me, but I've got to learn how to love. The capacity to serve is within me, but I've got to learn how to serve. The capacity to to do things in the name of God and for God are, 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 are all within me, but yet I must learn to do these things. With wisdom and understanding. You may have a great singing voice, but if you don't rehearse and practice and develop it, it will only be whatever it was in its rawest form. And for most of us, the rawest form of something is not sustainable because we don't know how to process it all. We're dependent upon the stewardship of others. For our very food. Someone may be dependent upon your stewardship for their very spiritual life. You may have the raw gift of evangelism ebbing and flowing within your life, but if you don't develop it, How many souls will go unreached because you didn't walk in wisdom and understanding? You didn't steward the capacity God had given to you. You didn't develop the gifts that God had placed within you. Stewardship's a very serious thing to God. Romans 12, brothers and sisters, in light of all I've shared with you about God's mercies, I urge you to offer your bodies as living and holy sacrifice to God. A sacred offering brings him pleasure. This is your reasonable, essential worship. Back to this stream. It's not just the words of praise now. It's the life of praise. I'm going to live a life that goes against the stream of decadence and cruelty and violence. I'm going to live a life that speaks life. I'm going to live a life that speaks hope. I'm going to live a life that gives grace. I'm going to live a life that treats people with dignity and honor. Because God has saved and God has redeemed and God desires to save and desires to redeem all of humanity. So there is evident self-worth in every human being because every human being is created by God. I have to steward that. I have to say you have value to me because you have value to God. You're important to me because you're important to God. And the gifts I bring aren't necessarily the gifts you're going to bring. I, I, you know, I may just bring a can of pumpkin. Well, I'm not having a pie with a can of pumpkin. Someone's got to do the other stuff. This is how the body works together. So what Paul told the Corinthian believers, you know, I threw a seed down, some plants, some water, but God gives the increase. But seeds left on the shelf bear no fruit. I'll say that again. Seeds left on the shelf 
bear no fruit. They have to get out of the container. Someone has to dig into the soil. Someone has to make sure the soil is rich and nutritious. Someone has to plant the seed, water it, sustain it, protect it from fungus and insects and, 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 other, uh, and other predators of the seed. You, you have to do this. It's like those poor souls who speak so much about what they are. Well, I'm, a, I'm a prophet. I'm a worshiper. I'm an apostle. I'm a, you know, God bless them. That's okay. I, I, I have no... I think your life should announce what you are. Your life should announce what you are. I shouldn't have to tell people I'm a Christian, although I'll never be ashamed, but Christ should emanate from the way I behave. The worst thing that could ever happen to you is to announce that you're a Christian and have them shocked. Really? It's God's seed, but it's our stewardship. We're given a measure of faith but we're called to grow in grace and knowledge. We're given a gift from God, but we're called to fan it into flame. That's what stewardship looks like. So it all begins with God, but humans are part of the process. So God starts it. Say it with me. God starts it. We steward it, and others sense it. You cannot hide forever what you are in your heart. Most of us can get through two hours on a Sunday. But you cannot hide forever what's in your heart. What is in your heart will come out. Like the seed that breaks through concrete or breaks through a rock. What is in you will come out of you. What you are will become known. An ungrateful, unspiritual, carnal, and immature person in mind and heart will behave and speak like it over time. If it's a good seed, it'll come out. If it's a weed, it will come out. Let's read our text again, this time from the voice translation. So imitate God, follow him like adored children, and live in love as the anointed one loved you, so much that he gave himself as a fragrant sacrifice. Say that word with me, fragrant. Say it again, fragrant. A fragrant sacrifice, pleasing God. Listen, don't let any kind of immorality be breathed among you. And demoralizing behaviors, perverse sexual acts, uncleanliness, greediness, and the like are inappropriate topics of conversation for those set apart as God's people. Don't swear or spurt nonsense. Don't make harsh jokes or clown around. Make proper use of your words and offer them thankfully in praise. What kind of aroma does your life emit? What kind of fragrance are your words giving? When you walk into the room, does the room get a little bit more energy because you're there? Do you bring fragrance? Do you bring laughter? Do you bring joy? Or do you bring cynicism, cynicalness, harshness, cruelty? Are you known as the one who's ready to fight over everything? Or do you only fight the battles the Lord is fighting? What is the fragrance of your life? 
What are your words saying about your heart? Jesus himself said this, the good man who is filled with goodness speaks good words, while the evil man who is filled with evil speaks evil words. I tell you this, verse 36, on the day of judgment, people will be called to account for every careless word they have ever said or posted. People will be called to account. That's not the words of Paul. That's written in red. How many careless words slipped out of my mouth this week? I'm terrified to think about it. How many careless words slipped out of your mouth this year? How many of us would have to be very silent if we took that verse seriously? While we learned differently. The ability to speak correctly, the ability to live correctly, the ability to be filled with thanksgiving is in you. If you're a child of God, it's in you. You don't need God to give it to you. He gave it to you. It's already done. What you need is the grace of stewardship. Lord, give me the grace to obey you. Help me to obey you. So when God provides the resources of life, including thanksgiving, and we steward this grace in our hearts, the result is that our lives become a sweet fragrance. An aroma of praise. And others sense that something has been cooking in your heart. I remember going to my grandmother's house for Thanksgiving in Tucson, Arizona. And I remember walking in her mobile home. And then before that, before my grandfather died, their little house in South Tucson. And I can remember walking in and, and as you open the door, the aroma of thanksgiving hit my nose. I gained five pounds standing in the doorway. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I'm telling you, I may not eat turkey any other time of the year, but on Thanksgiving, it's like, it's like prime rib. I mean, it's, I don't know what it is. But that aroma, and then she made cinnamon rolls, so that aroma. And then she had pumpkin pie. I'm getting, making you hungry, huh? I'm doing this on purpose. And she, had, she had pumpkin pie cooking, and that aroma's hitting you. And then there's the, the mashed potatoes. Oh, mashed potatoes, you know. And, 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 and gravy and all, you know, and then my dad would get in there and make his green beans and all, all those aromas. And you'd think all those different things cooking, it would be foul. Oh, no. Because it was all this fragrant beauty. Well, see, this is how the body's supposed to be. You may worship God with, with, your, with your instrument. You may worship God with your song. You may worship God with your, with your, with your beautiful flute. You may worship God with, your, with, your, with your, your preaching. You may worship God with your giving. You may worship God a hundred different ways. And, and one would think, well, one way is better than the other. No. No. See, God set it up. He put within you what you have to have to worship him correctly. He's already done that. So as you steward that, all these different aromas start rising up and they become a fragrant offering before the Lord. And those who are in that other stream catch what light looks like for a brief moment and go, I want some of that. They catch what joy is for a moment. They catch what peace looks like for a moment. They catch what honesty and authenticity look like for a moment. And it is so different than the way our world is right now that they, they, they long for that. A fragrant offering. A fragrant aroma. 
a sweet aroma. You see, go back on the screen, if you could, to Ephesians 5.2. I just want to have that up there for a minute. A fragrant sacrifice. Pleasing God. You can smell the fragrance of thanksgiving. You can smell the aroma of gratitude. See, something happened at my grandma's house. She found a recipe or she created herself. She combined those, inner, those ingredients that someone else had stewarded because someone else had harvested. She took the time to bake them. She invested her energy in it. She invested her resources. She had to pay for it. She multiplied the God-given gifts that had been given to her. And the collective resources that had been appropriated to her by others. She put all these things together. She didn't raise turkeys. She went and bought a turkey. She didn't raise clothes. She went and got clothes. Although I think she raised cinnamon rolls, but... She put all these things together, and those raw ingredients now are multiplied and able to bless others. Those cans become this. Next picture as my sister gets there. And now they get put in there. And every ingredient I laid out for you today, starting with the ginger root and all that, every one of those ingredients are in this. What I shared with you was a pumpkin pie in its raw form. But so God gave it to the raw form. Someone stewarded the raw form. And then someone else celebrated it and put it together so that others could be blessed by it. I never baked a pumpkin pie. But oh, I've been blessed by a pumpkin pie. Because someone else did all sorts of work. This is what the church does. This is work. We take the raw materials that God has given to us. We process it. We work on it. We make mistakes. That's why the house of God is here. So that we can learn to do stuff in here. And if we make mistakes, we can grow. Nobody's a 10 at everything. We give our time. We give our energy. We give our resources. In other words, we imitate God. We live a life of love. We offer thanksgiving. And not only does it bless us, because there's no greater joy for us than seeing someone else blessed by what God had given to us. So not only does it bless us, but it does bless those others. And you become the answer to someone's prayer. This is the way Peter said it. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Don't leave the seed on the shelf. Don't leave the raw materials in the store. Go get them. Invest in them. Learn how to put them together correctly. Practice it. Work it. And serve someone else. Then you'll be just like Jesus. In that moment. A fragrant offering. I'll close with Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. He said this. Rejoice always. Everybody say always. always. It's all the time. When it's good, rejoice. When it's bad, rejoice. Rejoice always. How can I do that? Because God put the seed of joy in you. Steward it. It's not from what's out here. It's from what's in here. I can rejoice when I get a pay raise. Yeah, rejoice when you get a pay cut. Huh? It's in you. 
I can rejoice when I get a new job. Rejoice when you lose the old job. Why? Because God's in charge of your jobs. you got a better one coming, apparently. Rejoice. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything. Give thanks. In everything. Give thanks. In everything. Give thanks. The good things and the bad things, the hard things and the easy things, the difficult things and the things that cause me to just kind of flow through life and feel like I got the wind at my back. In everything. Give thanks. Altars are made out of rocks. Quit tripping over the rock that God's trying to make an altar. Put those rocks together. Bow your knee, not to the rock, but to the God who made the rocks and say, God, this hard thing you've put in my life must have purpose. Therefore, I will praise you here in this hard thing. Why, Pastor? Because he tells us this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He said, I need to know God's will for my life. Start with thanksgiving. I need to know God's purpose for me. Start with thanksgiving. I need to know God's plan for my future. Start with thanksgiving. Because that is already written as his will for you. God starts it. We stupid. it. And others will sense it. Please